May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Smells are surer than sights or sounds to make your heartstrings break, Vladimir Nabokov. The fourth gospel, St. John, that we have just heard this morning is shot through with the human senses. It is a profoundly this-worldly gospel of the incarnation the senses of taste and sight, of touch, and today specifically of smell. The smell of the perfume costing almost an entire year's worth of wages, permeating every single nook and cranny of that house in which Lazarus and Mary and Martha call their home. That smell, of course, that fragrance in marked contrast to the odor of death, which we have, of course, reclining with Christ at table in none other than Lazarus. Also, the smell, the scent of love in the face of certain betrayal, the perfume of extravagant love, Mary's foreshadowing the embodiment of Christ's commandment, love one another as I have loved you, and what is the central action of St. John's Gospels, Eucharistic narrative that he reaches beneath the feet of his disciples and washes them. Abundant grace that thus far only Christ has been able to bestow is now bestowed on him. An odor not to counteract death, to erase death's stench or to over, overpower its stink, mentioned only verses before, but a scent to smell at one and the same time as the scent of death. And I wonder to myself, is that the central point of this narrative that we have heard today. Smell does not replace, but smell contrasts between varying degrees and notes, high notes and bass notes, tenor notes and alto notes, harmonies and, of course, disharmony. We are pungent, whether we like it or not. And I pointed out to the eight o'clock congregation since Napoleon was here, not Napoleon himself, of course, but the tiny uh, Rottweiler markinged dog, uh, Napoleon Taffy's dog, to him, we are pungent. He can tell who you are long before he can see you because he can smell you. We have relatively crude senses of smell in comparison with animals. We are pungent. And St. John's Gospel is redolent with the aroma of all kinds of events. The good wine at Cana, 
the smell of the hot sun on the well's stone walls near a Samaritan village, the smell of bread baking, the smell of mud spread on the eyes of the man born blind, the smell of green pasture, of grass to nurture a hungry flock of sheep, and to offer rest for a weary shepherd. The smell of the decomposing body of Lazarus. What is it about smell? Those that please and those that repulse. Those essences to which we are drawn and in which we delight, and those fumes that drive us away and so cause the distance, those that anticipate and those that repel, all too human and situated in this earth is quite possibly the entire point. Christ is the Word of God, the second oozier of the Trinity, the second person of the Trinity, played in the human key, not merely appearing to be human, but taking on our frail flesh and blood, our bone, our being, our humanity, our pungency. The simultaneous smells of life and death, those are the hard things that we have to accept in life and death, that they exist together. And we try to avoid, of course, so much of what is real. We cover up, we mask, whether it be through Febreze or Penhaligon's Blenheim bouquet, we try and disguise, but the reality is we are human and we smell. There is a decided down-to-earthness about redemption and faith. They do not occur in squeaky, clean, colourless, odourless spheres of existence, but redemption and faith occur in the very thisness of our predicament, of our world, in this broken world. And we resist death and smell and odour at our own risk, turning the incarnation upside down. And that is the power of this gospel text. Like the sense of smell itself, this text holds together Lent, Passion Sunday, Holy Week, and the events of Easter very tightly and succinctly. One wonders how on earth did we ever manage to separate out and distinguish so carefully between each nuanced event. These senses that are so evocative are mentioned over and over again in St. John's Gospel. St. Peter sitting on the seashore on the morning of the resurrection, bereft of his Lord, next to a charcoal fire on which to cook breakfast, will recall, even perhaps alarmingly, that the last time that he sensed and smelt a charcoal fire was in the courtyard of the high priest 
where he denies his Lord thrice. Death is the ending of this earthly life. And of course, we in our culture try to ignore it. And ignore it at our own peril, I would add. We try to make it a sanitized, we try to make it an acceptable ritual, a rite of passage. But there is something profoundly deresonating about death that tears us up by the very roots. We do grieve. It is not a happy, happy time of celebration throughout. Certainly there are times of recollection and the remembrance of those good elements and experiences, but there is also a profound ending to the physicality of the thisness of existence. But we trust and we believe, we perceive and we sense that the presence of the risen Christ, who is surrounded by angels and archangels and carries with him the very scent of heaven, is always there to support, to love, and to care for us, whether we like it or not, whether we realize it or not. Death is the gateway that opens into another pasture, into a new vineyard, and into a new kingdom, where Christ, with the Father, and the Holy Ghost, the eternal Trinity, liveth and reigneth, ever one God, world without end. Amen.